words sometimes don't express the deep appreciation that we have for the men and women who have served this country, who are now serving this country in faraway places and at home, and uh, those especially who have given their lives. The price has been paid. It was in the fall of last year that I found myself in the airport in Gulfport, Mississippi, along with some of you, as we were there that night to welcome Jack Warmack home uh, after he uh, had been a part of the honor flight trip to Washington, D.C. And everyone there, hundreds of people, gave those wonderful veterans a spirit welcome home ovation. It had been a long day, and all of those veterans were tired. Jack spoke about what an a, a, a unbelievable day it had been for him and for the rest of those service people, and yet how tired and worn out he was. Later, the week later, Jack sat down with me on a Wednesday afternoon before he was to help tutor, and he shared with me how much it meant uh, to be able to go to Washington and to see the World War II Memorial honoring all the soldiers who had died and who had served our nation so well. As Jack spoke, uh, my m mind wandered back to some guys that I went to school with that back in the late 60s and early 1970s and 71 who had gone to Vietnam and had a couple of those guys had given their life for the sake of freedom for that nation. And uh, I re was thinking back to that uh, wall, that black granite wall that is located uh, just a, a few hundred feet from the World War II Memorial and all the names of almost 50,000 men and women who had died during the Vietnam conflict, soldiers who had paid the ultimate price for freedom's sake. Brothers and sisters, all of us owe a great debt of gratitude to every man and woman who has served this nation, especially to those who paid the ultimate sacrifice by giving their lives. On this Memorial Day Sunday and tomorrow on Memorial Day, we're called to bend a knee and lift a prayer of thanksgiving for all the sacrifices that were made to keep this nation free. Walls have so many different uses throughout the world. Some are very valuable and come at a very high cost and help us to remember sacrifices and other walls that we build ourselves have the power to separate and divide. As we come to worship this morning, the church, as we do every Sunday, we're called to remember the sacrifices that Christ made on our behalf, not only for freedom's sake, but for the sake of the salvation of every believer. For it was his sacrifice, the greatest of all sacrifices, that offers hope to a sin-riddled world. I must confess that there are times that I feel that this nation has lost appreciation for the freedom that we speak about, the freedom that we sometimes sing about. That 
we as a nation, it seems to me, and I know to many others, we're fast moving away from God as our center and our hope and the things that these men and women that we honor today have made. I believe that there is coming a time when the blood shed by these national heroes will lose much of its significance. But that will not happen to the sacrifice that Christ made on Calvary. The sacrifice that Christ made will never, ever be forgotten. Sacrifices like that have the power to change the understanding of human beings. It has the power to change the course of history for all mankind. In our text this morning, St. Paul, as he writes to the church at Ephesus and to the church at Rome, he reminds us of that sacrifice that Jesus made and what that sacrifice has brought to us. So I want to share first from Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. Actually, we want to go back one verse to 13. Paul is writing what it means to be united by the Holy Spirit at, in our worship, in our service to Jesus Christ. And he writes, But now in Jesus Christ you were who were once far off, far away. That's you and me, brothers and sisters. That's Gentiles. That's 99% of the world or maybe even more than that. Once those who were once far away have now been brought near through the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law and its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace, and in this one body to reconcile both the Jew and the Gentile to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. And he came and he preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by the one Spirit. And then from Romans chapter 5 verse 1 and 2. Therefore, since we've been justified through faith, that means forgiven, that our sins have been forgiven, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We have peace with God. You know, through the course of history, people have fought for peace. From the beginning of time. And I believe that tells us that one of the greatest needs that we as human beings have is to be at peace. First, peace with God, and then peace with ourselves. But isn't it ironic, strange as it were, that the, one of the greatest needs that we have outside of our salvation in Jesus Christ, to have peace with God and be at peace in the world, that we struggle so much. We seek, and yet oftentimes we do not find. So Paul is 
is helping us through these two texts to help us to understand what we need to remember, what was accomplished on the cross at Calvary so that we, as God's people, Americans, Christians all over the world, so that we as God's people would have peace. And the first is that Christ made the ultimate sacrifice that brought us peace with God. There's an old uh, drawing that I have in, in one of my Bibles. Uh, those of you who have been on, in some of the Bible studies that, I, that we've shared together, you've seen this drawing uh, as I put it on the blackboard. And uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a, uh, a drawing of where we are as humanity and where God is. And in between, there's a great gulf. And that gulf cannot be crossed over. We don't have the ability to get from our side to God's side. And that gulf appeared and, and, and took form because of our sinfulness. The Bible says that at the Garden of Eden, when sin first entered into the lives of human beings that this gulf was created because Adam and Eve desired not to be at peace with God. They wanted to make all their decisions. They thought that they knew what was better for them than God did. And so God, because he created human, human beings free, he allowed Adam and Eve to make those decisions bad choices, and those choices have affected humanity ever since. And when Adam and Eve were moved out of the garden, and God placed the cherubim with the flaming swords that went back and forth, humanity could not enter into that garden by themselves again. It was that gulf that was created, that separated us from God. And even though we still longed for peace, even though we, we still thought that we could uh, live a life that would be pleasing to God, and, and somehow uh, the two would be brought back together, it never happened. Because, you see, our sinful just, sinfulness just got worse and worse and worse. It created a, a problem that no human being could solve by ourselves. But God knew all that was going to take place. <laughs> that's, a, that's strange to me how God sometimes, oftentimes, let us hang ourselves by doing the things that are sinful. When all we had to do was to listen to God and do what he asked, and that gulf would have never been created. So how are we to have peace? You know, when, when the great wars were solved, ended, they were ended by mediators bringing both sides together. And they sat down at the peace table. I remember uh, during the Vietnam War because I was a young adult struggling to stay in school and thinking that I might be called and shipped out to Vietnam. And I was, uh, uh, I was struggling with life and struggling with that war as a lot of Americans were. But the thing that I struggled with most, it, it took the United States and the Vietnamese government more than a year to decide what shape that table of peace would be. <laughs> and finally, they began to put these pieces of the puzzle of peace together and a mediator was used to solve that armed conflict. It was the same during the Korea. It was the same during World War II. It was the same during World War I. It was the same during 
uh, the Spanish-American War. It was the same in the Civil War. It's, there had to be somebody that would come and mediate those peace talks and bring those two sides together. Well, that's what God did when he sent Christ. Christ came as the mediator to bring together humanity and God to bridge the gap that we had created out of our own pride and arrogance, thinking that we could solve all of our problems by ourselves, thinking that we knew what was best for us instead of the God that created us. And so Christ came as the mediator, and when he went to the cross at Calvary, the sacrifice that he paid became the bridge that brought humanity back to God. When we think about the millions of men and women who have given their lives since the founding of this nation to keep it free, and not only America, but other nations around the world to share freedom and democracy because you see brothers and sisters whether we want to admit it or not our deepest need is a need to be at peace because peace is so violent it always harms those who who didn't want to be at war with any nation or anyone much less their neighbor who didn't want to be at war with God and yet they were dragged in to that conflict because of the wrong choices that we as human beings made. And so God has always provided a mediator. And today, as we celebrate Memorial Day, we remember sacrifices. Let us never forget the sacrifice that will stand to the last day, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Well, Paul says that not only did Christ bring us the opportunity to be at peace, but he also brought us the presence of God. We talked a little bit about that last week when we celebrated Pentecost, the gift of the Holy Spirit, and all that, that he does for us on a daily basis. Not only does he make peace available to us, but he makes the presence of God available. And what an awesome presence it is to know that no matter what you're going through, whether you've lost a, a spouse or child during armed conflict, whether you've lost a, a spouse or a child for whatever reason, Maybe you are, have been through a, a, a loss of a marriage, a loss of a job, financial difficulty. Maybe you uh, have walked that trail of, of sickness and faced difficult health issues to know that no matter where you walk, no matter what you experience, that God's presence is always with us. Now here's the, here's the connecting point on that. There's a lot of people, there are Christians today that think that they're alone, that they feel alone because they, and we at times as well, do not take the time to nurture that relationship, to learn how to trust God's promises even when we don't feel his presence. Because you see, the Christian faith is not based on feeling. The Christian faith is based on faith. Believing what God's word says. And when Jesus says, I'll never leave you alone. Even though you might not feel the presence of the Holy Spirit, he is there with us. Nothing is too important than the God that we worship through Jesus Christ, for that God to be with us. 
I'm a history major and um, um, I still enjoy reading a little bit of history. And uh, I remember reading a story about Abraham Lincoln. Y'all remember that man? Yeah. Uh, he was a man who sacrificed much for the freedom of our nation. God used Abraham Lincoln as a mediator to bring the North and the South back together again. He gave his life so that that would happen. There's a wonderful story about Lincoln. He was one of the first presidents in our nation's history to open up his office to his family. Uh, and the, uh, a story came out of Lincoln's time as president that one day the youngest child uh, came in and a uh, Miss Kennedy, as it were, were was uh, Lincoln's secretary. And Lincoln was meeting with uh, uh, the generals, planning war strategy, finding, seeking to find a way to bring that war to a close. And his youngest son came in and he said, where's my daddy? She said, he's in his office, but you can't go in. He's too busy to see you. And he just smiled at Miss Kennedy. He, he said, as he opened the door, my daddy's never too busy. And she watched him walk up past that long table to where his dad was sitting and to crawl up in his dad's lap. And then he bent over and looked at Miss Kennedy and went, Now, supposedly, that's a true story. And I share that with you because God's never too busy for us to come. That's what he wants us to do. He wants us to, to live within his peace, and he wants us to know without a doubt that the sacrifice that Christ made on Calvary, that we can come to him any time. In, in the uh, letter... Uh, we call the book of Hebrews. The writer of that says that we can boldly come into the throne room of God and climb right up in his lap, sin and all, that he loves us that much. And he's willing to put us in his lap no matter who we are or what we bring with us because he loves us. Brothers and sisters, to remember and to pay tribute to the men and women who have paid the ultimate sacrifice in this nation so that you and I can be here. It's an awesome thing. Don't take that freedom for granted. Don't take your freedom to worship for granted. Because I want to tell you there are forces in this world that are at work to take that freedom away from us. Be thankful for the sacrifice that Christ made for you and for me. And, and to make the most of that sacrifice. Not just on Sunday morning. I, I sometimes believe God would rather have our worship on Monday through Saturday and forget about Sunday. Because you see, it's usually the other way around. We come and we worship on Sunday, but we don't do a good job of giving him the time, or the recognition Monday through Saturday. Or maybe, maybe a, a, a thank you, Lord, for the food that we're about to consume. That's better than nothing. But he wants a whole lot more. Because you see, <laughs> only in that relationship with Christ can we be blessed by the presence of God that we can be blessed by the power of God. And both of those working together brings peace with God. So don't take your, your freedom for granted. Sometime tomorrow, find a time, just, just you and God, and, and just give him five minutes. 
Well, if you're not doing anything important, how about giving him 10 minutes? And offer up prayers of thanksgiving for the men and women who gave their lives so that you and I could be here today. Offer up prayers of thanksgiving, especially for Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that he made on Calvary so that you and I could be right here in his house today. Moments with the Father are absolutely powerful and they can change who we are in the light of the love and presence of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Lord, uh, we are so blessed. And yet we find ourselves as a nation, even as your church, under threat of those who would seek to worm their way into our nation and into our lives who in one form or another are seeking to take away the freedom that's been given to us. Lord, forgive us for abusing that freedom. Show us how to use it to bring glory and honor to you, Lord Jesus. We ask these things in your name. Amen.